in my dream, I saw how God took a piece of clay and put it on one of the first machines, the potter's wheel, and formed from it the first robot. And he brought him to life with his divine breath and called him man. And he created him in his own image as an artificial god. I found a book called My Mathematical Biophysics in Widener Library. And this was a wonderful book of essays by a scientist named Nicholas Ryshevsky. And the artificial god, man, soon dreamed of becoming a real god. And he created many machines in his own image, which combined were supposed to become an artificial man. And he worked on this project for thousands of years. This was just shortly after World War II. I went to, to um, college in 1946, which was just after the... <clears throat> I spent a year in the, in the Navy in 1945, but the war ended then, and uh, that ended <clears throat> with me being admitted to Harvard and... Um, meeting all the wonderful people who had been displaced from Europe during World War II. So there were a great many uh, great scientists in, in that area, and over the next few years I met many of these great people. I had lunch with Einstein and Gödel and Robert Oppenheimer and... Uh, many people who figured in the second half of the 20th century science. Man created two kinds of machines. One as an extension of his body with arms and legs, muscles and joints. And he let them work for him. The other machine was to be the extension of his brain. But it was much more difficult to construct since the work of the brain is done in the dark. And I think humanists are actually uh, disrespectful when they say that your thoughts come from a soul, a little tiny thing that has no structure. I think they are insulting you because your thoughts come from a hundred thousand million cells working in a tremendously sophisticated organization. And that's the thing that we should respect in people. The idea that it comes from a soul is uh, like looking at the frame of a picture and not seeing the picture. I invented the confocal microscope, which was an instrument that had a higher resolving power than the machines available of those times. And uh, by the time I finished it, I got more interested in the theories of how the nervous system worked. Mm -hmm. And uh, I made one set of pictures of a few neurons and uh, never turned the machine on again. In my dream, I saw strange animals that could think and speak. But they were just artificial men. The robots are the artificial gods, who themselves are the robots of the original gods. What we call emotions is the process in which we switch from using one of these kinds of thinking to another kind of thinking. Now what I'm saying, I think, is that in order to be intelligent, we will have to give the machine several different kinds of thinking, and when it switches from one of those to another, we will say that it is changing emotions. But the emotion is not a very profound thing. I think it's just a switch between different modes of operation. And in order to make a machine smart, we'll probably have to have a certain number of these different divisions. By the late 1980s, the world had changed, and it was interesting because when I started research in that, that general area, almost all of my students soon became professors. 
maybe 70 or 80 percent of them. Eventually, I think we will understand all about the brain. It may take hundreds of years, it may take less than that, it may take more than that. But eventually we'll understand the machinery that produces the human mind and we'll be able to build machines like that, perhaps larger, uh, perhaps more specialized, perhaps designed to do other things that are quite different from what people can do. So the future has unlimited possibilities. No, I think I made some strategic mistakes. Um, my first uh, book about artificial intelligence uh, was a book called The Society of Mind, mm -hmm. and it had one-page chapters. And this book was very influential because uh, it had the feature that if you didn't understand one of these chapters, you could just skim it, and it wouldn't matter very much. Oh. And the result was that uh, great numbers of high school students understood most of the theories. And... Uh, knew more than their professors did when they got to college. And uh, then I wrote a second book called The Emotion Machine, uh, which had longer, more conventional chapters. And it has slightly better theories, uh, but they're much harder to understand because I didn't break them into tiny portions. Generally, whenever there's something new, there is a great deal of fear about it, and that will never go away, but they will fear different things at different times. And uh, the fear is valuable because that's what stabilizes a society and prevents it from changing too fast and making serious mistakes. So I think there should always be fear of new things. Uh, perhaps a society, a human culture, can only tolerate a few new ideas each generation. And if it accepted too many uh, without testing them, uh, surely many of them would be disastrous. So I think it's good to have people who do not want us to build artificial intelligence. Then a new generation appeared with Isaac Asimov. John Campbell, the editor of Astounding Science Fiction, uh, started to write in the 1940s, 30s and 40s, and... Uh, by accident, I happened to be in just the right place. I, Isaac Asimov lived nearby, and when I started to uh, that group to to make robots and things like that, Isaac was around to discuss it. He refused to come to the lab to see them, and I wondered why. And he said, oh, "Well, I I'm writing about really intelligent robots of the future." <laughs> Probably, there will soon be machines with consciousness. But there will never be a machine with self-awareness. There is no meta-language to program such a machine. Because the language of self-awareness is already the highest level of any humanly possible language. In five billion years, the sun will grow very large and hot and will burn everything on the Earth. So we have only 5,000 million years to find a better uh, place to go and a way to change so that we can survive these disasters. For all we know, in the same amount of time, our galaxy itself will become a dangerous black hole with a quasar. And so uh, we have only perhaps five or 10 billion years left before we must leave not just this star, but this galaxy. And uh, we will have to change our form to take those long journeys through interstellar space. Well, there's progress, and I've been watching it slow down for the last eight or ten years, so I'm a little bit not less optimistic about when it will happen. Very interesting. So you, you think it's decelerating rather than accelerating? Well, in artificial intelligence, it's certainly... Uh, well, because of this phenomenon that very few uh, young people who are show promise have been able to get jobs. So uh, I'm not 
I haven't seen very much progress in the last uh, 10 or 15 years. Our machine descendants are just as much our product as our children, and perhaps more. Because you see, your children are not your creation. Your children are the children of the dinosaurs, not of you, in a genetic sense. Uh, you're only the medium. But the robots are really your children if you help to make them, and you should feel closer to them than to other animals because you're more responsible for them.